So our next speaker is Kyle Felker from Princeton University. His field is applied in computational mathematics. His advisor is James Stone, and his practicum was at Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. Thank you. So I'll be talking about a numerical method I added to this uh, fairly large astrophysics code that my advisor wrote. But I'll mostly be focusing on the work in the past year after I wrote the method paper to make it fast and make it useful and hopefully, hopefully releasing it to the public version of the code with, over the summer. But you'll see a lot of HPC and, and hardware tribulations in here and that's really one, what I wanted to talk about. And because we're getting close to lunch, I'll keep all the math on the first three slides. So I have Hillary to thank to, hopefully to thank to convince you that MHD is important uh, in, in space physics. I'm not an astrophysicist myself, but you can trust me that the magnetic fields are crucial to a lot of events uh, in space. And simulating these uh, has a couple of requirements here. Um, so first of all, we want to get the conservation properties of the underlying physics correct. But we also want to get highly accurate solutions, which involve uh, using uh, high order polynomials to approximate quantities across a grid, if you use a grid based method like Athena is. But we also want to use these high accurate methods without introducing any artifacts into the solution that certainly aren't there. And we often don't see oscillations in, in natural when observing these systems in real life. And importantly for the magnetic field, we need to satisfy the divergence constraint to 16 digits in double precision because there's been a lot of interesting studies that show if you have even just a tiny bit of error, it's going to result in unphysical behavior in, in your modeled system. So just a really brief overview of the existing method for just the hydrodynamics in Athena. And here you can see the logo on a type of mesh that you would solve a, a fluid problem or an MHD problem on. And if you look in one direction, the update is, is quite simple. We do uh, linear fitting across the cells, which depend on these four cells in one direction. Um, you can't just do a blind interpolation because that'll result in oscillations. So there's a, a method with limiters, they call them, to result in good non oscillatory solutions. And so you get two approximate states at the interface, and then you feed that into a black box that's pretty expensive. And you do this over billions of cells. Um, over many cycles and time steps, and eventually you say how much is how much of the fluid is moving into your, your adjacent cell. So it's pretty simple, and it's it's directionally split, so we can just do that in all directions for a cell, and you have uh, the next step. So this is a slide from a recent astrophysics talk that I gave, um, and so there's a lot of unnecessary math in here, and I'm just going to I left it in here to illustrate just how much more complicated getting a fourth order accurate method or one way of doing so can be and why it's an HPC issue. Um, so when I say it's fourth order accurate, by the way, it means that every time you double your grid resolution, you should get you know, a much smaller error than the quarter ratio you would get in a, in a second order of method. Oops. There we go. So we replace the linear interpolations with parabolas. That's a one obvious way to get to higher order, but you can't just do it in one direction anymore because your second order multidimensional approximations involve the adjacent cells in the other directions. And so you do a lot more stuff. And the point here is this takes a lot longer than the 1D update at the second order method. And so we turn to HPC. So Athena++, as I mentioned, is a fairly large astrophysics code. It replaced an earlier C version from the last decade uh, and it's 63,000 lines of C++, a lot of developers that are moving in and out of the code. Here you can see a visualization that you can make in an afternoon uh, if you have any Git repository, that's kind of fun. You can see the different users and all of them committing to different parts of the, to the directory structure. This is, starts in 2014, so I don't appear until a few years later, uh, but you'll see a lot of activities such as I was trying to force, once I was given admin access to the code, I it was inspired by previous CSGF conferences, and I obviously like tools, and like a lot of you here, developers here. And so I added continuous integration through both a Jenkins server and a Travis CI cloud service, which if you're, familiar, if you're not familiar with them, 
it runs a set of regression tests that you define every time someone adds a change to the code. So you find out immediately if you broke the code with your new addition, such as the high order method, and then you get an angry email uh, from me or you get a push to your Slack channel. Um, and it's really useful. I don't know how you would ever maintain a code of this size without it in the future. Um, and we have a public version, as I said, um, and I'm pushing to release more often. You can find it here and you can see some of my comments there. But going to the performance, and this is something I've worked on a lot in the last year, I came in and the MPI and the OpenMP was already well done. It scales well, as you'll see in a second. But uh, compared to the earlier version of the code, there's a lot more explicit vectorization. In particular, with we used OpenMP 4.5 pragmas on all of our loops so that 95% of the code is vectorized. This replaces earlier Intel vectorization approaches that were in the code. And so the result is you can get, for a single core of three different architectures that I tested on here, uh, the Skylake being a, a Xeon CPU, um, which is the newest, we can get 4.5 million hydrodynamic updates per second, um, and about half that for the MHD down here um, for the second order method. So all these, these statistics are for the, the second order method. But the single core performance numbers, you know, are only part of the picture, and it's something that we've all known for a while, but I think the gravity of how different the pictures may look has really set in as I've worked over this last year to increase the speed of the fourth order method. Um, and so when my advisor was writing, decided to redesign the code to have a lot of vectorization in it to make it faster, obviously uh, he faced a question that many people here have faced uh, is that, if you want access to the supercomputers, you have to choose in some ways to define your codes for the GPU machines or the x86 machines. The x86 uh, high perform, you know, at, uh, at NERSC, right, Corey has the KNLs, so he chose to go with the KNL route and the x86 route for portability. And I, and I, I like the route, you don't have to use any OpenACC, although I think we're going to get some in the HPC workshop later this week, and it's nice and it's getting better, but you result in a very portable code that uses different levels of Intel vectorization um, from 128 bits all the way to 512 bits on the KNLs and the Skylakes. Um, and so the high order methods, the motivation for this is that you can see as these vector widths uh, get longer and longer in the new architectures that um, we can fit more into them to get more operations per cycle. So if this is our second order stencil, just say four doubles, and we fit it into kind of the previous generation of AVX, and we do one operation simultaneously to all four, you can think of the high order method as you know, it's got a longer stencil, more operations, and so we can just really uh, use the AVX 512 um, registers. And in practice though, the application itself is very memory bandwidth bound as many applications of grid-based codes are because you're constantly going through this, you know, billions of cells possibly, loading them into different levels of cache and then feeding them to these buffers and you have to make sure that everything stays in cache in order to get the benefits of the AVX 512 and so it's a lot trickier in practice than this simple picture would uh, indicate. And furthermore, something that you don't see mentioned a lot because Intel's very secretive about their Turbo Boost or Smart Turbo Boost 3.0 is that once you start using these large, you know, these wider vector widths, is that the clock frequency actually uh, is clocked down, and so your single, your you know, your your scalar speed is is reduced, and it takes some time for the power to turn back up due to the thermal limits of these of these packages, and so it's a lot trickier now than it was you know five years before when vector in, there still was vectorization, but it's harder to take advantage of these, these full widths. And so here's the scaling plot I'm gonna show. This is still for the second order method that's already in the code, but the fourth order method scales similarly with MPI. Um, they've tested it on Blue Gene Q, millions of cores, uh, most of the machine. And you can see here it's you know, 90, 99% scalable. You have some issues. Um, so what I want to draw your attention to, though, is the single core scalability, which you don't often see on these plots. And so on the left, we have a, a Skylake CPU, 24 cores uh, total, dual socket, 
And you can see the efficiency is quite bad. You know, those numbers I showed you earlier with the four million zone cycle else updates per second um, is up at the, you know, the peak up here of the float 64. Um, but you get down to 30% efficiency on node because all of these cores are trying to load into the vector registers, pull from cache that's already oversubscribed, and it results in really poor efficiency. But then once you go off node, everything looks good. But you can also see in the illustration of the, these, these plots that the single precision and the double precision, the single precision performance is about twice the double precision, precision in performance as we would expect. And that just goes back to the fact that you can pack twice as many in there. So back to what I was saying with the single core versus multi-core optimization route. So this is something I suggest everyone implement some form if you're concerned about performance. Uh, it's kind of a regression test that I've set up for the performance of the code. So on the bottom on the x-axis and of all these, uh, you can see the, the date of the commit. And so it goes all the way back to 2016. Um, you'll see the most recent Skylake architecture all the way on the right and an old, much older Sandy Bridge architecture right next to it. So you can see I was trying to optimize the code for the fourth order performance. And some change I made in November 2017 dropped the performance on Skylake a lot, but I was testing only on Sandy Bridge on the older version of the code. And suddenly I got some emails from angry collaborators saying, you know, you slowed my code down immensely. And I'm like, I, I haven't seen anything like this on the tests that I've run locally. And this is something I'm sure a lot of people, you know, in, in the national labs with wider code bases um, have been using for a long time now, but you really need to test on multiple architectures, even if you're just targeting the same type of CPU. And so this is just the single core performance, which is highly variable depending on what the switches, what switches you have for the compiler on. But you can see on the full node performance, just using flat MPI across all the cores, that it's a little less sensitive uh, to the changes that you're making to the code or to the compiler flags. Um, but nevertheless, you can do pretty important things to speed up the, for, in, for example, the extended stencils of the high order method. Uh, you can do a lot of things to speed them up um, by improving the memory bandwidth usage. So I'll briefly show you now that I've hopefully convinced you that we have uh, all these um, you know, these fast vector registers, uh, why we should use a fourth order method, but should this fourth order method, uh, does it even, is it even worth it to, to run in, in the end? So here's an error plot of a, a simple problem that, a globally smooth problem that I tested the method on. And so at the top you see the blue line gives the existing second order method, uh, gives you the total error as you increase the resolution of the code. And so you see that you would need to increase the resolution by eight in each dimension uh, to have equal error at order accuracy uh, solutions for this globally smooth problem as the high order methods at the bottom. And so I think you could be a lot slower than the second order method um, and still come out ahead and by, by doing a much smaller problem with a high order accurate, accurate method. But uh, not all problems, all the easy problems are smooth, but uh, real problems have discontinuities in, in this field. And so here we take an example of a magnetic field loop, um, which, you know, there's, it's advected by this fluid that's moving in the diagonal. And it should maintain its shape if the method is well designed, even while still being high order accurate. And you can see a hole opens up in the beginning. It's much larger in the, in the less order accurate method. And you can see, it's harder to see on this, this projector, but uh, you, you're getting like, um, non-uniformity in the second order solution where the fourth order solution is a bit more uniform. But the point is, is that we're getting a, a, an accurate solution uh, without causing un, you know, artificial artifacts in the solution. Um, and further and more importantly, perhaps, we are ensuring that the constraint on the magnetic field is maintained below you know, double precision machine round off. That's really what it means to be equal to zero in the finite precision sense. And so, Everything you can see in the path of the field loop, we're getting some artifacts from, you know, uh, inexact arithmetic and, and, other, and other sources of, of uh, error, but it's effectively zero, and so we can trust our solution. And finally, then, here's a more complicated uh, shock tube or shock problem with in MHD, where you just have collision, collisions of MHD shocks interacting with themselves. Um, 
And the second order and the fourth order solution look kind of similar, but you can, if you look closely, you can kind of see that the fourth order solution has a brighter center, it's had some more refined features in, in the outskirts from the center. And this is really what we want to do next, is take a look at problems like these that are more complicated or real turbulence problems that are occurring in, in accretion disks and see if the fourth order method, so it, well optimized, is, is worth it and what options are the best kind of configuration for the code and for the code users. And so our initial, after all that optimization, making the, the second order method fast, currently we're six to eight times more expensive to doing, doing the fourth order method for the equivalent problem. But in certain cases, it'll definitely be worth it. In certain cases, it may not. And the arithmetic intensity of the overall method is much higher, which is, is promising from coming up with optimizations for it and making it truly worth it so we never have to use the low order method. And like I said, we're going to check all the different options that we can, that we can run in, in the code in order to apply it to uh, you know, the shearing box simulations that are occurring in disks of matter around black holes and extend it to other parts of uh, aspects of the code, functionality of the code. And thanks so much to the CSGF, and I'd like to thank my advisor, and thank you.